So good afternoon from Switzerland, ladies and gentlemen, and good day to you wherever you are. And a warm welcome to the Horaces panel on the topic exemplifying inspirational leadership that I have the privilege of chairing. My name is Isabel Nüsli. I'm a leadership coach, a book author, and chairperson of the Responsible Leadership Institute. Today, we have a panel of highly distinguished, insightful, and of course, inspirational leaders to whom we're going to ask a few burning questions and hear their viewpoints on this critical topic. Well, today's world has never been more VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. The pandemic and the recent war outbreak have accentuated this and brought truly challenging times and with them a test, a real test of leadership. Leaders' impact on, on countries, communities, cultures, businesses, and everyday people is significant. And demands on leaders have increased in all areas. We all know that leadership theories and, and experiments, they come and go, but two constants remain. One is change, and the other one is the need for able leaders, courageous and ethical souls with a mix of competence, humanity, and intuition. And the good quality or amongst the good leaders, at the, an important quality they need to possess is the ability to inspire. And even before the pandemic, only 10 to 15 percent of employees fell into the category of being engaged. And that number most likely hasn't risen since. So research has shown that the ability to inspire leads to the highest degree of commitment and engagement, but it also helps attract top talents. Robin Sharma stated that leadership is not about the title or a designation. It's about impact, influence, and inspiration. And Brian Tracy said that become the kind of leader people would follow voluntarily, even if you had no title or position. So what makes an inspirational leader? Let's ask our four panelists. Preeti Tubey, founder and director Strive High Singapore. Karine de Meyer, founder, Women of the World, US, currently in South Africa. Jeff Seibert, uh, co-founder, Digits US. And Anna Tunkel, head of global strategic initiatives and partnerships at Worldwide US. So thank you for being with us today, dear panelists. How would you describe inspirational leaders? What's the fabric they are made of? Preeti, please share with us your view on this. Thanks a lot for uh, setting the stage so appropriately, Isabel. Uh, greetings, everyone. Very warm greetings from warm Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Preeti Dubey, a management psychologist by profession and founder and director of Strive High, a boutique soft skills consultancy and training company based out of Singapore with operations across Asia, Pac, US and the UK. I've trained professionals from senior to mid-management level positions from diverse verticals, uh, ranging from shipping, um, tech companies, banking and finance, medical industries. Um, personally, I have corporate experience working with multinationals in various sectors in different management positions. So my experience helps me in significantly understanding the issues uh, that professionals face and addressing them appropriately by developing learning and development into uh, interventions. So, and delivering them in the form of personalized coaching and training that is customized for concerned teams and individuals. Now, as for your question regarding inspirational leadership, as is self-explanatory, entails inspiring others to accomplish the goals and objectives in collaboration with them. So when people feel inspired, as you very well said, they're intrinsically motivated to achieve the best outcome to the extent that they challenge themselves and perform beyond expectations, even though it requires intense hard work and people are not machines. They don't simply do what they're asked to. They act as per their understanding, beliefs, values and ambitions. Now, these factors are largely invisible. So inspirational leaders need to connect with others emotionally, with empathy, earn their trust with care and compassion, influence by setting the right example, channel their energy and drive behavior in the right direction. 
Now, it requires getting people's buy-in by communicating the uh, vision articulately to help them see the big picture, identify what it takes to accomplish goals, and most importantly, know what is in there, there for them. So inspirational leadership is very crucial during times of uncertainty, such as the current env environment, when it requires thinking creatively, ethically, and responsibly, morally, to find solutions to problems never experienced before. Unprecedented situations demand exceptional courage, dedication, and devotion. The inspirational leader's job is to provide the right direction and instill whatever it takes attitude to accomplish the goals of their teams. Beautifully said. Thank you, Preeti. Karin, um, how does your description of an inspirational leader look and sound like? Well, for me, I think it means that a leader knows who he or she is and is connected with her or his own source. And mm -hmm. that it's somebody who radiates energy um, and who is willing to be vulnerable and who allows other people to be the, to actually become the best versions of themselves. And um, I think becoming an inspirational leadership or actually a leader, it's also, it is a life process, you know? And um, um, I have always found it very inspiring. I mean, I was educated in the United States, both graduate and undergraduate. I'm actually now in South Africa, but I've been living in New York a lot. And I've always noticed that in, in um, America, older people are often still very much part of the business world because they're actually being admired for their wisdom and for their inspiration. And I mean, I know that we're always saying, you know, young people are the ones and everything. No, I actually think that we should actually grow old in that sense, also business wise and really like allow older people to actually, you know, take much more space into the business world. So as with women of the world, I have noticed that, women are we've actually had to take more time and actually to actually take our space into the um, business world i was educated at a women's college i was surrounded by a thousand women so i mean there was never any competition we were all going to be either one of us was actually going to become president of the united states well that almost happened uh, four years ago or five years ago anyway and now i think that we are in a situation where women all over the world are feeling, you know, absolutely actually, also, I think post pandemic, I think women were hit the hardest having to take care of children, still trying to like maintain their job. I mean, there is now the great rec uh, resignation going on where women are like, well, in this old job that doesn't work for me anymore. And so I think in a way, a lot more women all around the world are actually connecting with their own inspiration and are actually becoming leaders themselves for their own environment. So for me, inspiration is very much knowing who you are, um, connecting with that, sharing that with other people and not to feel competition because I think everyone is actually a great leader. Absolutely, uh, Craig, thank you. Karin, uh, do you mind sharing with us a bit of your background and maybe that uh, two words, three words on women of the world? Well, so women of the world was actually a natural result of my year's work for TED Women, which is a global platform, you know, because, you know, I mean, everyone knows the TED conferences. However, they were actually seeing with the presentations that very often women were much better speakers um, because they actually put much more emotions into the stories. It's not only about facts, but it's also about being vulnerable. So that's when TED Women was actually started 11 years ago. And I joined actually the Dutch uh, version. And after the TED Women in America, we were actually the second one. And um, out of that, I started to create these interactive female leadership trips around the world. And I'm actually about to embark on my fifth one to the to the UAE around the World Expo, because it's yeah. the first time in history that there was actually a women's pavilion created. And the Cartier is actually this main sponsor of that, the Cartier Women's Initiative. And I really saw it as my you know, as founder of Women uh, of the World, as my mission to bring women from 9, 10, 15 different countries to come together and to share their experiences and to actually feel that if everything is possible, and I mean, I'm, I do not know if any one of you has ever been to the UAE, but that is a country where literally everything is possible and they can decide within a month that they go and actually transition to a four and a half day work week to be aligned with the Western world. 
men and women are paid equally if they're educated equally but the country which is my origin the netherlands we we are actually still battling that and women have to learn how to actually de um learn how to you know get more money and actually with an equal salary so those are sort of the missions that i have brilliant thank you very much uh jeff your thoughts on the topic or comments on your previous speakers Yes, and uh, Isabel, thank you so much for having me. It's really fun to be here. Um, as a quick background, I'm a serial startup founder, entrepreneur, angel investor. I live right outside of San Francisco, sort of in Silicon Valley, California. Um, I started a company called Crashlytics back in 2011, doing mobile crash analysis and performance analysis. Um, that code now runs on 5 billion active smartphones. So effectively every phone on earth right now that's actively used. Um, in 2015, I was named head of consumer product for Twitter. So hopefully everyone listening in is familiar with Twitter, maybe has tried it, um, led the core development of the, of the mobile app and website for a year or so. Um, and then in 2018, I founded Digits, which is my current company. And we're on a mission to build modern, intuitive finance software for small businesses um, so that they can really save a ton of time, better understand their business, better grow their business, and not be stuck with sort of decades old, early 90s fintech software. Um, so to me, uh, what defines an inspirational leader is someone who motivates the people around them, who builds alignment and is able to paint a vision of sort of how great something can be and how we can get there. And what I've seen is that leaders come in all different shapes and sizes. You can have these very loud, outward facing, charismatic personalities. You can have these very quiet, confident personalities and because it's not about you as the leader, it's about how you actually inspire others. And mm -hmm. so to, what matters to me is, is your ability to bring people together um, and nurture this sort of shared understanding um, and nurture and build the energy and excitement among the group you're leading to then go and, and achieve that understanding or achieve that mission, whatever that group might be working on. Um, and so what I really think is, is the pinnacle of the role is if you champion the work your people are doing and you champion the people actually doing the work, you can almost recede from the picture and still be a leader. Um, and that to me is sort of the peak of it because then what really matters, what you're really putting emphasis on is the actual people doing the work and the work you're all doing. Thank you, Jeff. I like you said, nurturing the shared understanding. That's a beautiful term. Very nice. Thanks, Anna. Please share with us your viewpoints. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And um, I guess the, the enviable uh, job of going last is that so many wonderful things already have been said, and I wholeheartedly agree with, with all of you. Um, I'm Anna Tunko. I'm the head of strategic initiatives and uh, global partnerships at APCO Worldwide. We're one of the world's largest majority of women owned and independent global advisory firms. Um, that also focuses on public affairs and strategic communications. Uh, we're operational in more than 60 markets uh, around the world. Uh, my career has uh, taken me from Russia to Israel, from India to Switzerland, and uh, from China to uh, most recently in New York, uh, where I'm based. And uh, throughout uh, these years and working across uh, different sectors, private, public, international organizations, I have uh, ample opportunities of observing and, and learning from, uh, from leaders of all walks of life. So delighted to, to be in this uh, esteemed group and you know, being able to share uh, some of that experience and perspective. And um, uh, I very much um, agree uh, with Karin that this is a journey and, uh, and uh, sort of where uh, leaders are not made and sort of shaped and uh, sort of stay, stay that way. It's, it's something that we all you know, it's, it's an evolutionary process. So I wanted to share maybe three um, kind of observations um, on leadership. One um, is that you really don't need to have the sort of the top job to have people follow your footsteps. footsteps. I mean, in this day and age, um, sort of inspiring leader often sort of is this that moniker attached to like a CEO title. And I would but I beg to, to defer and disagree. And especially as there's so many pressing issues today on the global agenda from really fostering more diverse and inclusive cultures uh, in our organizations to advancing climate action, actually 
some of the more inspiring leaders emerged from less uh, traditional uh, walks of life. And so from people like uh, Melati Wichson, who is an 18 year old um, in Bali, Indonesia, who led to the abolishment of the plastics uh, movement, um, to people even within our own organization at APCO, a group of some 20, late 20 year olds who are uh, leading and have built and are leading our employee resource groups um, within our organization, groups that are really pushing and influencing our inclusivity stra uh, strategy. And we dubbed this Accelerate What's Right uh, within ECHO. And um, just seeing uh, these emerging young leaders who are pushing our organization forward is, is really phenomenal. I think the second point is that inspiring leaders often emerge unexpectedly. Um, I, I think we all are witnessing the heartbreak that is going on right now with Russian invasion of Ukraine and um, watching Vladimir Zelensky um, has been a true inspiration. And, you know, speaking of a leader who leads from the heart, is comfortable in his own skin and is authentic and is determined and courageous, um, perhaps in the direst of circumstances um, is I think is is an example we can we can all learn from um, and perhaps related the third point is that um, inspirational leaders back their words with action uh, and I think especially in the last couple of years with uh, renewed focus on ESG, environmental, social and governance um, priorities, sustainable development goals, so much work that we all individually and collectively ought to do. It's those who really back the those commitments with concrete next steps and, and action, be it smaller scale and incremental, is I think what's, what really contributes to, to more effective leadership and, and one I think we would ought to emulate. And I'm happy to talk more you know, as, we, as we get going. There's, there's much for us to cover uh, about, you know, again, what I've seen in, in some of these commitments uh, sort of across different markets. Beautiful. Thank you, Anna. So many new aspects, um, the buzzword authenticity that definitely needs to be included here. So, and you know that research has shown that the more is more. So meaning more of the mention in competencies and behavior, um, and, and qualities, the higher leaders score actually on, on inspiration. So that's interesting too. Well, after having shared, uh, your definition and all the ingredients of an inspirational leader, what role, if any, does culture play? when comparing um, inspirational corporate leaders from different areas of the world. And can inspiring others be learned? And if so, how long does it take to develop globalized leadership skills dedicated to, to inspire the future? Jeff, what is your view on, on this? It's a really great question. And I think actually some of the other panelists are probably far better experienced than me at the, at the different global uh, repercussions of it. But what I, when I was sort of thrown into this role at Twitter, um, it was the first time I was I sort of head teams in 11 different offices all around the world. And it was a really interesting process to go and meet the local leaders of those offices and understand what mattered to them and how they saw Twitter's role in the world within their country and in their neighboring area um, and what was important to them. And it really opened my eyes to the first time of how drastically different um, people saw like what Silicon Valley was, what the product was, why we were building it, all of that. Um, and just getting to meet our team members in Japan and in India and in Ireland and in so and like all very, very different perspectives. And I think what really struck me and, and I hope what I did well is not coming with any sort of pre-assumptions or just like just honestly sitting and listening and letting them share what mattered to them and then helping bring that back to our headquarters and helping share with other people at the company and other teams. And, and as I said earlier, try to build this understanding because when you don't like when you can't meet the people face to face or when you don't really understand and you just make assumptions you're going to make decisions that you think are well-intentioned that are extremely insulting. And so what was really important to me in the role was to come in with sort of just eyes wide open, trying to learn as much as possible and bring all that data back so that we really guide where we wanted to go. Great insight. Thank you, Jeff. Anna, please proceed. Uh, sure. Um, and, you know, I would actually argue that, um, you know, it's not so much the culture piece, it's the values and convictions that transcend uh, national boundaries and uh, 
um, and geographies. And uh, there are some things that are, you know, truly um, kind of ubiquitous if you, if you look at uh, some of the, the different uh, leadership styles. And, you know, I wanted to bring, be very, I was thinking in preparation for the session about like, how can I both best illustrate this notion that I have that it, it, it is not about culture, it's about personalities and, and values. And so I wanted to bring examples from Pakistan, Sweden, and um, you know, a Jewish, Polish, Cuban immigrant that is my boss, who inspired me greatly uh, over the years. So the first with going to Pakistan is Malala. Um, I had a great opportunity and privilege to, to advise her and her team on her first participation in, in Davos. And she was really on a mission to advance universal K-12 education for women and girls. And in a room full of CEOs who are, you know, Davos regulars. She was probably one of the quietest people I've ever met and most self-spoken, but yet most impactful. And it was her quiet determination and conviction in what she believed and what she believed was right that completely silenced the room and got people engaged and really got people to listen. And, and to me, this was, you know, just like such a strong manifestation of, uh, again, the, the power of personality and, and conviction. Another one um, is going to Sweden. And again, over the years, I had a great opportunity to, to work closely with uh, with IKEA's global team and their inspirational leader, Jesper Brodan. And it goes back to my earlier point about, yes, you can have leaders with charisma and energy, which, of course, you know, he brings to the table. Um, but walking the walk on one's convictions and commitments and sort of you, if you set lofty goals of uh, climate action and then actually backing them up with investing in renewable energy fleet, uh, phasing out plastics and packaging, coming up with concrete programs and how you accelerate your supplier's transition to renewable energy. And then, you know, taking a deep look at to what you can do as, as a company and then educate your consumers on circular and um, circularity and how you can make more sustainable living choices, I think is key. And what's, I think, really interesting about IKEA is that they hold all leaders accountable. So every single president uh, of IKEA's markets, you know, markets in their business, holds both the title and responsibility of not just the president, but chief sustainability officer. So I think that's really powerful where you really create that accountability across the organization. And finally, um, you know, I've been with APCO somewhat, I guess, uh, abnormally for, for the past decade and a half, which is, you know, typically people switch jobs, you know, they're at more rapid pace. And they're <laughs> one of the many reasons that I've stayed uh, in a firm that has taken me probably across you know, half a dozen different markets and roles um, is is my boss, our founder. Uh, she's an immigrant. Something is to be said, by the way, about immigrant mindset and how immigrants are resilient, entrepreneurial, and often you know exemplify some of those you know, leadership traits that we talk about. Um, and so she, you know, Marjorie Krauss built, has this unique ability to get to the bottom of what motivates people. And I'm sure you can appreciate that you know, with a business that kind of spans the world, those motivating factors are different in China and in Dubai and London and, and Singapore. Um, and yet getting to the bottom of that motivation really unlocks this extra drive and purpose in people to give to your company, to give to your our clients. And then more importantly for us is this broader societal impact drive. And then finally, I'll probably say that, you know, it's something I've been also reflecting on and trying to emulate with my teams uh, that I manage, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, or that know something that you don't, and, um, and have enough confidence to do that, because that's where you, I think, build truly impactful teams and lean in into, you know, your, your weaknesses and, and you know, make them into your strength. Where we can rub our shoulders. You know, I like to do. But previously, you you brought up authenticity. You know, you were um, you mentioned personal responsibility or accountability. Usually, I link these two. You know, I like authenticity, but only when it comes with personal accountability, because you can also be an authentic jerk, right? Uh, so I think it's important <laughs> also to um, combine these two. So just that a few thoughts sure. on my end. Um, Pretty, uh, please. Your thoughts on, on, on this question, values, culture? Well, uh, in my opinion, culture plays a very significant role in inspirational leadership. So while working with their global counterparts, the leaders need to remember that management styles across different cultures stem from habits developed over a lifetime, making them hard to change. And the culture actually influences behavioral responses of people to different situations. It shapes their sensitivities, including how they interpret behaviors of others and respond to them. 
as the leaders success depends upon how well they get the job done whether it is in terms of creating strategy or mobilizing teams to action to accomplish their goals leaders need to know what words and gestures would appeal to people and persuade them to take the right steps so leaders should be able to sense and even anticipate the team's reaction to their message uh, and effectively carry everyone along toward the intended goal so for now people like like uh, like some of you said that behave a little bit differently uh, for example people in japan china india philippines and singapore have subtle defenses in expressing their emotions and thoughts if we compare with the us it is known to have one of the most individualistic cultures go globally so the more individualistic the culture the more freely people exhibit their feelings and articulate their thoughts they express their messages explicitly uh, you know explicitly they return uh, in return they might even expect uh, the same from their global counterparts so the american culture emphasizes less on power distance which means uh, that hierarchy is not strictly followed uh superiors are accessible both managers and employees expect to be consulted and information is shared frequently communication is informal direct and participate participate uh, participate so on the other hand china is known to have a highly collectivistic culture followed by malaysia philippines japan and india score somewhere in the middle so now those those countries are also relatively high on power distance indicating that the, uh, the appreciation of hierarchy and top down structure society and organizations is a lot more so in collectivistic cultures people may not openly express the thoughts and feelings and verbal communication may be subdued and indirect so the leader should have the ability to decode those subtle non verbal cues to understand them appropriately and gradually build trust and the challenge lies in interpreting cultural nuances in the right light without stereotyping people and jumping into erroneous assumptions now the leaders need to be adept at interpreting these behavioral signals which which happens by understanding deep rooted uh, beliefs and value systems which uh, actually affect their ability to respond effectively uh and uh, you know exert stronger uh, influence so the leaders act as the group's emotional guide during uncertainty or threat now these are the current situation that we are facing the team members look at the leaders for assurance and clarity an inspirational leader should be able to clear the smog created by toxic emotions and drive collective emotions positively to ensure that the job is done well so to answer to the question can inspirational leadership be learned the answer is yes because inspirational leaders as we know need to be perceptive empathetic controlled self aware and willing to take responsibility for their actions uh, they need to get work done develop others and all these are emotional intelligence competencies so the personalities are are are, are constant but emotional intelligence can be developed in focused areas the challenge is that this is an uh, old conditioned habit which is which is formed for law you know since past a long time so to be it, it takes time to disappear but with diligent efforts and focused attention old old habits will diminish and the new behaviors can become stronger uh, pathways in the brain So breaking old patterns that are no longer productive. Yeah. So that was a beautiful and compelling walk through the cultural map. Thank you, Preeti. Karin, would love to hear your thoughts on on the topic. Can it be learned? The cultural values. Well, I think the reason why I created Women of the World is because I wanted women to be able to learn from one another. which cultural boundaries these women are you know um juggling with and to be able to share what it has been like for them because i mean um during my women studies at harvard i really studied the matriarchal societies in the world and there are still eight left and um mm-hmm. as i mentioned to you uh, you know before the talk had before i've actually spent last 16 months for the last two years in costa rica which is one of the oldest matriarchal societies called the bribris and actually the women of the world is actually based on those values it's like you know when you start when like women start helping each other when like you know 
when I actually used to say to women, if you've reached a boardroom or like a high level, try to bring a woman and, you know, allow her to actually step into your footsteps because, you know, you were actually standing on the shoulders of a lot of women. And then, you know, there's an opening. I mean, men need to make space for you. Unfortunately, we have not been around as long in the business world as men have. And so many of the rules were actually defined by men. So if, if as a female leader, you're actually able to, play that game a little bit that the men, you know, allow you and that they don't see as a threat. I remember during Harvard, there was a course called Leading Teams and there was a professor, Richard Hackman, and he had actually studied the Boston Symphonic Orchestra where they were only hiring men when they had the auditions. And then they were going to starting with blind auditions and they had headphones on <laughs> and then so that they wouldn't hear the women coming in with their skirts. And then all of a sudden when the audition started, they actually hired 40% women in the Boston Symphonic Orchestra. And the people who were regular visitors of the auditorium, they actually saw a change in music because women interpret music differently than men do. I'm not saying they're better, but they have a different approach and you'll, and you will feel it, you know, it'll be maybe more musical, maybe more dramatic, whatever. And anyway, and by like creating all these women in the world um, events together, women start sharing these stories with one another and they start to understand what actually makes them unique, you know, and what makes them actually connected to the other women. And they feel much more connected to, to a global energy. I think it really makes women grow more. And I think also business wise, I think when like women start seeing business also as a matriarchal thing that you can actually you know, share your values with the younger women and actually, you know, be a mentor or be a sponsor for somebody. I mean, I was actually going to add on to Anna. You were talking about IKEA. They actually donated already 20 million euros to the Ukraine for any, to like a UNHCR. So, I mean, that, that company is actually really practicing what they preach. And I was, of course, also thinking of Greta Thunberg. I've actually had the pleasure of meeting her twice first in Davos, she was literally sleeping on top of the mountain in a tent and it was minus 18 and we were all in our hotels and I was like, wow. And then I actually saw her again in Glasgow and I saw all these protests. I'm like, this one girl has been able to actually ignite, you know, something like a feeling of hope with all of us. And I think that makes an inspirational leader. I think it's wonderful, Malala Yousafzai, and then we have Greta Thunberg there, that we as adults, feel inspired by them. And then we have Jane Goodall and Sir David Attenborough on the other side. They are they are our champions and we are all in between. And I think we are all moving into the right directions. And I'm just very, very hurt about what's happening, what's happening in the Ukraine now. And I'm also, you know, doing my work in trying to help women, especially, you know, to reach the border and to bring them into safety. Well, we are taking deep breaths. Um, thank you very much. And another um, brilliant and, and story to, to grasp. So you four are truly inspirational and the inspiration is contagious. And we want more. So I like to do a round of um, experience. You have so much, there's so much experience and knowledge on this panel. So I would like to hear a few more personal stories um, in, in the next round. So Anna, um, please tell us about the time your personal leadership made an impact on your organization. So what specifically did you do and how did you do it and why did it work? Um, sure. And I think it's it's still a work in progress, right? <laughs> so I, I would you know, probably be, be a bit more humble in terms of the amount of impact that it's creating. But I think we, we all talked a bit about sort of, again, this authenticity part and how what you do really needs to align with your values and passion and, and then you really truly create um, impact. And so over my years with the firm, again, across different markets, um, I've, uh, and, you know, not just me personally, but we've worked on um, on this notion of finding common agenda across different organizations and, and really helping catalyze action around critical issues, be it advancing more gender equality, um, uh, focusing on kind of developing, helping organizations develop skills in, in their employees and sort of this broader reskilling agenda to really commitments to sustainability and circularity. And, um, and over the years, again, just realizing that um, oftentimes organizations operate in silos and what one needs to do best is really to break those silos, but also um, create um, an incentive to, to collaborate and chart that path forward, right? We all talk about stakeholder engagement, but not, you know, often sort of what does that actually mean and where is that point of, you know, 
connectivity that on the topic of, for example, financial inclusion brings together a large multinational with a series of NGOs and perhaps um, academia. And so um, we've done so many of those projects. And so I've uh, decided to really um, create more of an infrastructure around this. And so I've built a global team that is focusing on what we call impact multiplying partnerships, uh, charting that common uh, agenda course uh, across so many industries and markets that we touch um, and really help catalyze action in, in that regard. So this team is uh, uh, mighty and growing. And so I'm so proud of, of the work that uh, each and every one uh, of, of my team members are doing and also how we connect with the rest of the organization. We have about 1,000 people across APCO. We touch most of Fortune 100 companies. We frequently work with international organizations. And I feel you know, almost um, you know, vindicated because this notion of uh, rethinking partnerships is becoming front and center. And so multilateral organizations are uh, rethinking their strategies of engaging with the private sector. Uh, businesses really understand that they need to sort of build those partnerships around business objectives first and foremost, uh, but then obviously be guided by uh, societal uh, impact and expectations. So I'm uh, excited about this work and, and where it will uh, take us. Thank you, Anna. So impact multiplying partnerships. Never heard. I like it. It's uh, impactful. Um, uh, who's next? Jeff, Jeff, please share with us um, some of your personal stories or one of them or two of them. I'm sure you're full, as, as you've told me the last time, you're full of personal stories. So can't wait to hear them. Yeah, I'll tell a, a very tactical, uh, very sort of behind the scenes story of Twitter. So if you go back to 2015, the company was in a really difficult position. They had IPO'd a couple years before, very well, like successful, well-known IPO. And then the stock had basically just started plummeting thereafter. And growth had flatlined. They were dealing with 33% year-on-year attrition of the team. Um, and the whole company was about 4,000 people. So we were losing like 1,000 a year. And this resulted in a complete leadership vacuum on sort of the core product and engineering efforts. And at the time I was running Twitter's developer platform and our developer team was basically one of the only large teams in the company that had effectively zero attrition. And we were actually hitting our deadlines. And so they asked me to come over and lead consumer product. And so this was a team of roughly sort of 500 together engineers, uh, product managers and designers that built the main core of Twitter experience. And my approach was to like come in and say, I know nothing. I'm just going to learn what's going on and then let's see what we can do about it. Mm -hmm. And so ended up, as I said, meeting with all these different office leaders, meeting with all these different team leads. And what it really struck me, the issue was, was there were about 120 sub teams within those 500 and they were all slowly pulling the product and company apart. They all had their own goals, own directions. And it was basically this political nightmare where they were trying to battle for resources and get their priority across the line without anyone paying attention to the bigger picture. And when you asked anyone outside of Twitter what the company was working on, they had no idea. When you asked people in sales or in marketing what the company was working on, they had no idea. And what I realized is it was a complete lack of storytelling leadership. No, like these people were doing good work but no one knew what it was or why it was. And as a result, they were all sort of going in slightly different directions. And so actually for the first time in Twitter's history, I led a process to basically understand and prioritize what the company was working on. And from those 120 teams, we sort of coalesced folks into top 10 themes. And so we had 10 themes of what the company was trying to do that year. And none of these came from me. I was basically just documenting what these were and then clustering them so that we could tell a cohesive story. And from there, we could then give all hands presentations and we did a huge investor conference and presentation. And we basically told the story of our 10 themes for the year. And seven of them ended up actually shipping and succeeding. And so yeah. the big lesson I took away from that was actually, it, it was less about the work. It was more about how do you story tell and align everyone on what you're doing and that was sort of the biggest transformation and ended up now Twitter has shipped a lot of those things. Great story, yeah. role model story. So without further ado, Karine, please share your story or stories with us. Well, um, I was part of the Women in Tech Global Movement. I actually um, was the one who helped launch it in the Netherlands. It was started in 2018. I did the launch in the Netherlands. And then when I was living in New York, I was asked to do the launch actually in the US. 
And this was a voluntary platform. So everyone around the world, and you know, I was actually also the CCO, so I was actually the chief commercial officer, and I was trying to, you know, get as many women in many, many countries, you know, to actually join our movement. But it was a voluntary movement. And I noticed that there is a limit to asking people to do things voluntarily, especially when they're on high level jobs. And, it, and we, we were really trying to get the high level women in technology to be the role models and the mentors for us. And also to actually start running the programs that we had developed uh, within their companies. And actually at this moment, now I'm in South Africa and I just spent a day with the South African country director and we actually now are paying certain people within the organization and it's actually allowed the company to do so much better because there's a limit. I mean, I've actually done a lot of charity work in my life, but there is a difference. You need to value people. You need to, you know, you need to pay them what they're worth, especially if there's a commercial interest and you do want to start charging people for when they start advertising their jobs to the platform. And it should not be that the founder of the movement should be the only one who's actually benefiting. I think it should be like a collective earning model. And so I'm very happy that that, that, that voluntary network has been able to actually tran transition to that because I think that it'll make the success of the movement go much quicker. I think it'll allow high level tech, technology women to actually join the movement as well. And I think it'll allow to actually empowerment of females, you know, through technology, which I really think is key for a woman these days, you know, if you want to become successful in your, in your work um, to do that. So um, that's actually a quick thing. Cause I know we are, I know we're running out of time, so I didn't want to take up too much. No, thank you very much. It's absolutely. I could, could not agree more. Uh -uh. Preeti, uh, in your role as leadership consultant and coach, have you noticed a pattern in specific leadership competencies that are, let's say, weak or, or missing in terms of leadership needs and current skills? Can you elaborate on this a bit? Uh, thanks a lot for this question, Isabel. And uh, as as was obvious from what Jeff said and what Kareen said and what Anna said, said is is that there is a there's a big role that empathy plays in practicing inspirational mm -hmm. leadership. However, as people climb the hierarchical ladder, the pressure to bring result increases, and the need to be efficient pushes people to create take quick decisions and get things done faster. So with so much to do, the leaders uh, who are not, not uh, naturally empathetic and has not made diligent efforts to cultivate the skill might find it too time consuming, dispiriting, uh, exhausting and unsustainable to practice empathy. So being empathic, uh, em uh, empathetic involves entering the emotional zone, which can be uncomfortable experience and cause a fear of discomfort. So people might worry, what if the person gets angry or sad or cries? And this is the kind of question that leaders often debate while preparing for a difficult conversation, especially if they're not, they don't have the skill or willingness to handle this. So it's easier to avoid the entire gamut of things uh, and do get things done your way, especially when you believe that you have the best solution in hand. So you know that your personal abilities have actually earned you this position. So in a rush to get things done, it is easy to overlook uh, the need to stop list, and listen to others' perspectives and develop them along the way. So when this pattern becomes a habit, it changes the brain. The research has proven that power corrupts brain wiring. In psychology, this is called hubris syndrome. Mm -hmm. What that power makes people mm -hmm. want to be mm -hmm. less empathetic, but the pattern created while taking on greater responsibilities and pressure can rewire the brain. And with no conscious fault of ours, forces us to stop caring about other people as much as we used to. So it's easy for us to notice such leaders around us or become one con unconsciously. So it's best to exercise caution and not to allow these blind stop, uh, blind spots blur our vision. So uh, empathy, compassion uh, is something that I think consciously they need to work on. So keep your inner spark bright and clear to ignite the fire in others and inspire them. So oh, what a fantastic final word. And uh, time, unfortunately, is up. It, it's I could have gone on. I don't know how it's with you for 
another hour or two. So, but I'd like to thank all panelists very much for your insights and your your your, your inspirations, but also for, for the audience for the attention. And all I can say is just keep getting inspired, keep inspired, inspiring others, and uh, all the best. Uh, stay safe. And, and uh, thank you to your fantastic moderation, Isabel. I mean, you 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 are a big part of why this discussion I think was uh, so authentic and, and impactful. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I just see that your original session has elapsed. Yeah. You can stay as long as you want, so at least. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. I and I would love to stay in touch, Anna and Preeti and Jeff. I just sent you a message. Actually, Jack Dorsey is my neighbor in Costa Rica. So, <laughs> oh, oh, is he? Oh, oh, oh it's speaking uh, about inspiration. And I would yeah. like to stay in touch with you, Anna and Preeti, as well. So, uh, absolutely, I'll, I'll connect with you now as well. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I would love to be in touch with you as well. I yes. work with a lot of women empowerment projects, and it would be nice to learn from you and to collaborate, and you know, to probably help extend. Well, what I would like. like that. I would like yes. to organize a trip to Singapore, so to the Far East. So I'll let you know. Do it. Do it.